Hey, you are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is London. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Hey, this is Chicago. How you doing? I saw you were out at the Tower of London today. We were. It was terrific. There was uh, nobody there. I actually, you know, we walked right into the Crown Jewels and wow. up into, it was, it's amazing going around places in London these days and there's just nobody there. So it was fun. Well, we want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, and we'll wait a moment or two to let people uh, sign in and join us. So please do, if you're joining us here, please post and say hello and let us know that you're here. And as we get started uh, with our interview today and get going, please put up any questions that you have as we go along. We're here every Saturday, whether you like it or not, <laughs> at 4 p.m. Eastern uh, on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages and of all of our shows so far, how many so far, Chris? This is 21. Uh, this is number 23. So we have 20, <laughs> 22 so far that are logged in um, on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours webpage. And we put the page down below. Quick, write it down, and you can go and watch every show. So greetings to everybody. We have people from uh, West Virginia, Terry Clark in South Jersey. Nancy is with us again, and Doreen, and Jack, and folks from Wisconsin, and and uh, Houston, and San Francisco. So we've got quite a, an array of folks joining us. There's Ted Moon. Ted has seen every show that we've done. I admit that some of the others of you have, too. Let us know if you have seen every show. But we know Ted has seen everyone, so greetings. Hey, Lizzie. And uh, Ted and Trish, and uh, Anne. And we're getting up here with people, Chris. So I am going to uh, give us a start here. We'll uh, we'll play the world-renowned. There we go. Drum roll. History happy hour. <laughs> And the bar is open. Oh, done. At least you remembered it this week. I did. And I want to start with a this day in history. Are you ready for that? I'm going to try. Okay. So it is 76 years ago today, okay. um, August 23rd, 1944. It happens in Brittany, France, during the – you might know that we invaded France that year. Really? Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah. And uh, it is the first day of a mission called Operation Breast by what unit, do you think, Chris? I don't know. Was the 8th Army there? Try again. Um, the, na the, the Navy. One more time, baby. The Ghost, the Ghost Army? Ghost Army. There you go. Everybody drink. Oh, oh, the Ghost Army. We got mentioned in early. This was the first day of Operation Breast. This is a picture of an inflatable tank from that operation, and it was the first operation where they used all their means of deception at once. So that's a very exciting this day in history. And now we've got the audience lubricated, so that's always a good start. Um, this week on History Happy Hour, it's our great pleasure to introduce and welcome author Hampton Sides, who joins us from New Mexico. Uh, he is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, uh, including Hellhound on His Trail, The Ghost Soldiers, which has nothing to do with the Ghost Army. I just want to mention You mentioned it again. Yeah. yeah. And uh, In the Kingdom of Ice, among other books. And each one of his books is kind of an epic adventure story, whether it involves a military operation or a manhunt or an expedition. So um, uh, really terrific books, and I, I highly recommend them. And uh, today we are going to talk to Hampton about his most recent book, on Desperate Ground, The Marines at the Reservoir, The Korean War's Greatest Battle, uh, available in uh, both paperback and um, hardcover, as you see here. And, uh, and then after we talk about that for a while, we're also going to twist his arm a little bit and see if we can't get him to tell us just a little bit about the book that he's working and writing on now. So we're going to put the pressure on there. Hampton, uh, welcome to History. Yeah, happy happy hour. Hour scoop. Yes, could be. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, guys, it's great to be with you. It's such a great idea, and uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. So, um, yeah, I, I, it is happy hour, but in New Mexico, it's only 2 o'clock. So, uh, alas, I'm drinking a little Pellegrino right now. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be, uh, you know, bourbon-free uh, during this hour, but looking forward to every minute, 
every every minute of it. Well, so Hampton will be the responsible adult in the room. And good. Yeah, you have to. You can be the designated <laughs> driver if things go terribly wrong. <laughs> Chris, what are you drinking? Um, I'm having that great British invention, gin and tonic in a can. Oh, fabulous. Oh, well, oh. I, have, I have a drink I've never had before. So it's called Jinro 24. And in honor of our topic today, it is Korean. It is yeah. distilled Korean spirits. It is the most popular drink in Korea. They drink 9 million bottles of this every day. And I want to credit Marilyn Ray Beyer went out to get me uh, an appropriate, a history appropriate drink for History Happy Hour. So um, I just want to see, we both want to see your reaction when you have this for the first time to see. <laughs> you are going to see it right now. All right. Yep. You know, it, 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 <laughs> um, the, we saw in some of the, the, the <laughs> literature on this that it used the phrase medicinal burn was the description. Yeah. <laughs> That's accurate. <laughs> um <laughs> Hampton, you're, you're wondering when we're going to get to interviewing you. So I guess we should start. Um, uh, the Korean War fought from 1950 to 1953 is sometimes called the forgotten conflict. And it's too bad that it is often forgotten because it's absolutely fascinating, both from a military and a political point of view. And one of the legendary battles in that is the Marines breakout from the Chosen Reservoir, um, which is essentially a fighting withdrawal uh, in the face of overwhelming odds and 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 sort of difficult situation. So, what drew you to this topic, and uh, what made you want to tell this story? Uh, I, sh I, I will say I had some of that medicinal burn myself during the research um, for the book. I went to I went to Korea, um, and and uh, it's strong, strong stuff, but good. Um, I don't know. I did this called the Forgotten War. Uh, the fact that it was a conflict that is kind of ambiguous in, in at least among my generation, uh, I'm sure that's one of the things that drove me to the subject. Um, it, it's also true that, um, you know, this was my parents' war. Uh, my father in law was in the Korean War. My stepfather was in the Korean War. Um, I, these are folks that, unfortunately, I've had to say goodbye to in the last few years. I, I wanted to understand what they were a part of. Uh, apart from endless episodes of MASH, um, I really didn't have much of a feel for what Korea was all about. Why were we there? What Was it just a sort of uh, an extension of World War II? Was it some sort of precursor to Vietnam? Uh, was it, was it, uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people think it was just a, a kind of a UN police action and, uh, it's sort of gotten short shrift and, it, and in the, uh, you know, public, you know, imagine. Um, so those are all, all reasons. Um, but it's also true that I had been hearing a little buzz in my ear a number of different times and in a number, a number of different places about this particular battle. The Battle of Chosen Reservoir, really epic about it, really special about it, and uh, the conditions under which it was fought. Uh, I've heard of Chosen called Go the Soldiers, uh, Army. Uh, um, and Bus, can, can, can you hear me okay? Is the sound good enough? You are, are we... breaking up a little bit now. You were. You're breaking up a little bit. Maybe you should try to click out and click in one more time here. Sorry that we're having this problem, folks. Yeah. But um, it might be on my end. But I will. Hard to know. Um, this is uh, this is we had some problems last week too. Having such an international program, Rick. Yeah, I guess so. We're banning the globe. We're pushing the technology as hard as we can. Maybe we need a new tech director. <laughs> I'm going to bring him back. And there you are back. Yeah. Can you? We are hearing. We, yeah. Um, uh, similar, but uh, keep going. 
you were uh, you were you were talking about um, why you write about this and why about chosen reservoir in particular. Right. I had written about the the Battle of Bataan in the Philippines and the march, and uh, in the book that I wrote, I was on book tour and I was doing a signing at some place in Virginia. This guy came up to me, this big, tough, gruff guy, and he said, uh, "This is great. you wrote the song, uh, but uh, you should write about the reservoir." And I was like, "Reservoir? What's the reservoir? I never heard of, heard of it." I also noticed that he was missing several dig tips hands as he had suffered from as so many of these men did and uh, i said well i just tucked that away and i filed it away and you know years later i began reading about the battle of chosen reservoir I realized that it was um, not only an amazing battle in and of itself but a kind of master key that unlocks an understanding of the whole war the korean war um, all the principal characters are there. You know, you have MacArthur, you have Mao, you have Stalin, you have, of course, Truman. And um, it all took place in 35 below zero weather in uh, this wilderness of North Korea, frozen alpine. Uh, and it just had a epic quality. And even though it's maybe the most famous battle of the Korean War, most people haven't heard of it because it happened during the Korean War. Um, so that's those are all things that drew me to it. Uh, that and also, the, I suppose I'd done a number of books about men in extreme circumstances, extreme weather, extreme sort of men pitted again. And that is true in this battle. Uh, the principal combatants are the Chinese and the American Marine, the Marines, but the third combatant are becomes this omnipresent, all suffering, um, how they survive it, how they deal with it, how it affects their mikeys, their weapons, um, just they prosecute this, try to prosecute a, a battle in those kinds of really unbelievable conditions. So that, that's, that's sort of the background on it. Um, are we any better on sound or are we... We're, we're getting ninety. We're getting 95% of it. Yeah. And 95% of Hampton sides is probably worth 110% yeah. of either of us. So, so <laughs> that's good. It'll, it'll, it'll. Well, it'll I really apologize. I apologize if it's on my end. I don't, I don't understand it's working when we. Yeah, play. we don't really understand Before. it either. So some days it's great and some days it's not. And some days it changes in the middle. So, um, Here's Chris in London, and he looks great. And there you go. I can't figure it out. <laughs> We're talking, though. We're talking. We're talking. It's all good. So, so Chris, Hampton, one of the things that um, maybe you could touch on is, is us getting to the Chosen Reservoir. Because, of course, there's a back and forth at the beginning of the war. And uh, Douglas MacArthur, the man who I'll tear a new one in a little bit, um, launches this landing at Inchon. And... And we advance north to the Yalu River, and everything's just hunky dory. Um, but but how do we find ourselves in the situation where this battle is fought? I know as as MacArthur's going north, he's told, "Don't piss off the Chinese, whatever you do." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we do. <laughs> well, we do. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that the first third of the book is a deconstruction. Of, of, a, of a massive intelligence failure and a massive leader here. Like we shouldn't have, the two armies should course. Uh, uh, Ultimately, were missed. Uh, ultimately, it becomes a question of hubris, of a very gross and grand, grandiloquent um, MacArthur. His career, a little past his expiration date, uh, Smelling ultimate victory uh, and getting a little, and not understanding the risks that the Chinese army 
Poe, truly. Um, classic early example of what do we call it? Um, asymmetrical warfare, you know, like this peasant army threat. Um, they, they, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have artillery. They didn't have an air force, but they were this guerrilla army that could move at night and could yeah, preserve the element of surprise and lived off the land. Uh, and they had numbers. Boy, did they have numbers. Uh, Mao was willing to just send hundreds of thousands and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of his men into battle. Um, so uh, this collision happened uh, finally at the Chosen Reservoir. And, uh, you know, MacArthur just, you know, he, did, I, he just didn't seem to see it come. And then once he, and the intelligence really finally did come in, he ignored it. He, he just didn't want to hear it. And he had surrounded himself perfectly with these Stick offense and yes, men in, in Tokyo where his office was. Uh, he was an absentee commander. He, he didn't battlefield. Uh, he only heard what he wanted to hear. To hear was go to the go to the Yalu. Got to go to the Yalu. When the Yalu River of Quiver that separates the border from China from man. So, um, so, uh, you know, when, when your commander doesn't go to the battlefield, he does to the on the ground, which near the end, accurate, it's certainly a little late in coming. But so, so then you have field level, you have who now I'm not Rick, I'm hearing you. Yeah, um, now that's how I was muted. So uh, okay. we're, all of our failures are coming here. So I, we, we, you're, we, we're still having some problems, and I deeply apologize. This is yeah. not the way I, I had hoped we would go. I'm going to ask you to take a bold action, which is we'll stall for a little bit. Chris is going to do his famous juggling act. And we, if you could restart oh, great, your great. computer and come back in. Mm -hmm. So restart your computer. Okay come back in and as soon as you come back in we'll we'll bring you back up because i just want people to hear what you're saying because it's really fascinating and interesting so you go oh, yeah. ahead and do that. Oh, I've been, I, hate, I hate that all right i'll call you get, thank you back. so much for bearing with us you're very kind no no okay so um juggling huh this is you know this is really everybody gets to see right inside everything that we're doing here um, and so, Chris, while, while we're waiting for Hampton to come back, um, I thought I'd play a little bit of this video uh, that uh, I found at the National Archives. Hampton was talking about the, the terrain and the, the weather kind of being two other enemies that we're fighting in addition to the Chinese. This takes place in February, I think, this battle. And um, it's 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 pretty nasty. I think even from this video, you get a sense of that. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's inconceivable. I mean, it's reading Hampton's book. I mean, he talks about interviewing uh, these guys that grew up in Wisconsin and cabins, you know, and, and then the, this one Marine says, Oh yeah, I thought I knew all about the cold until I went there. And, and it, it, the descriptions of the cold at the chosen are so extreme that they're almost unbelievable. Um, you know, radio batteries immediately going dead because it's so cold. Um, guns freezing up. I mean, it's, it's, but the temperatures are even colder than some of the ones they record for the Germans in Russia, you know, as they, as they try to approach Moscow that first one are just epically, epically cold. And it's um, one of the things I want to ask Hampton about is he said that he talks to individuals about, um, you know, how individuals do, deal with extreme situations. And one of the things that's always fascinated me about the Chosen Reservoir is you have 20,000 Americans and British and Korean soldiers who are dealing with this collectively and functioning not only as individuals, but as an organized unit, as a body of men. Um, and it, it's just, it's epic. Yeah. Well, and it's it's not only on the ground, but it's also in the air. And there's a there's a uh, there's all sorts of complications that come in here, um, because if you look at the uh, the map um, uh, that we have, if I can pull it up here, 
of the, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm sure everybody doesn't have the map of the chosen reservoir uh, breakout in their heads. I mean, essentially it's a fighting retreat. They've gotten as far north as the reservoir that you see up there, the body of blue water. And then the, the blue line back is the Marines are trying to get back to the safety of the coast and they are being absolutely hammered every inch along the way because there's basically one road that they can take back. And when they get uh, to a certain point in that road, there's a choke point so that they may not be able to get any further unless they can figure out how to do it. So it's quite uh, uh, extraordinary in that way. So um, look, here's Hampton Sides joining us again. And, Hello. Uh, yeah. Better? yeah, I think so. And and All even right. if it isn't, I'm going to lie from now on and say <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's it's I, I occasionally would look at the screen and, and your grimacing face would be there and I would go, uh oh, I can tell from uh, I'm not getting enough medicinal burn. That's the <laughs> problem. There you go. Um, but you know, I was you know, I was just talking about, you know, how I see the first third of the book as being this kind of study in hubris, you know, like what happens when someone like MacArthur, who's already quite arrogant, uh, in fact, uh, epically arrogant. Um, he had this amazing victory. Um, he had this amazing victory at, at Inchon, right. this amphibious invasion uh, of, of Inchon, which was the port city that served Seoul. And um, it was a great surprise and it worked brilliantly and he was riding high. And he took Seoul very quickly and got back to the pre-war border of the 38th parallel very quickly. And so then the question w became, well, do we stop there, call the war over, um, or do we keep going? And, you know, if he had stopped at the 38th parallel, the Korean War would have lasted three months. Instead, it lasted three years and millions of people died. Uh, mm. And uh, I don't certainly blame MacArthur for all of that. And, and certainly the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Truman, President Truman, and lots of others were kind of egging him on to, to keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, so, um, but um, ultimately, MacArthur is, is the most responsible for those lives that were lost in the battle. How, how's the sound now? Better? Yes. Yeah, it, is oh, actually better. it is better. Chris, All keep right. going. You're on a roll. Well, I'm no, on. you know. Uh, one of the things that, and this might be digging a little bit too deep, Hampton, but, um, and I'm certainly showing my bias, uh, but MacArthur, um, the man is an idiot. And, 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 and now, now, Chris, say what you think, okay? Don't hold back. Yeah. I, I mean, you have this wonderful quote in your book, a man with a solid regard for his own divinity. And, and, <laughs> and one yeah. of the things, you know, it, I was thinking about this all the time because on my trips, when we do the Pacific War Tour, people ask me about him. When I was editor for World War II magazine, I get questions about him. How was he allowed to continue to occupy his place on the stage? You know, and, and in World War II, it's the same thing. And then in Korea, and, and I guess so that's me ranting. But I guess my question would be more, how, how do you think it is that we got our command so epically wrong in Korea from, from, from MacArthur to Almond. Th mm -hmm. You know, we had just won world war two. We have George Marsh. We've got some bright guys. We know how to fight war. And then boy, you read about Korea and you just kind of shake your head and say, yeah. what just happened? Well, a couple of things. One is that you have to remember that MacArthur is pretty busy guy. He is running the occupation of Japan and the rewiring of that whole society. And, you know, most historians think that was his finest hour. You know, he really sort of became the emperor. Uh, it was a role that he was, <laughs> uh, it has been a whole life thinking he was the emperor. Well, now, now he really was the emperor. Uh, and he, you know, brought, Demo some modicum of democracy and, and you know, they turned it into a republic and rewired that whole society and was actually uh, doing a brilliant job at that and was quite, quite uh, suited for that role. Um, but he was busy. And then, you know, this thing erupts over there on the peninsula 
and he's not sure really what to make of it. He doesn't think it really amounts to much uh, at first. Uh, and, uh, you know, he said, we can, we can whip them with one hand tied behind my back. You know, it's a, uh, this is going to be easy. Well, you know, I think everyone had underestimated the, um, extent to which Stalin had armed North Korea had, had, had you know, there were advisors, there was artillery, there were tanks, uh, trained those armies of the, of the North and, uh, man, they steamrolled over Seoul in three days and were, you know, really on the verge of taking the entire peninsula. Uh, so we had to, we had to scramble. I, I think the other thing that's important to, to, to realize also is that there was still this kind of um, bias within the American uh, view of the world uh, that Europe is what mattered. Yeah. Uh, Europe was, you know, in World War II, we, we had to win in Europe first before we then took care of the Japanese. Uh, and I think there was this, uh, we, you know, a dearth of information, a dearth of expertise uh, pertaining to Asia. And MacArthur, you know, had spent most of his professional career in the Philippines. Uh, he lived more over there than he had in the United States. And there was therefore a kind of a deference, like, well, if MacArthur says this, and he thought he was this expert on the Asiatic mind and, you know, the way they think over there and the, what armies are really like. And uh, he thought he was an expert on China. Uh, and so they would defer to him. Um, and he was very persuasive. He was very eloquent. He, he was brilliant in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, he was also, I, I agree with you, Chris, he was also an idiot. Um, but, uh, but he was brilliant, you know, in, in the way he framed his arguments. And right. he was just like a, an incredible salesman um, for his own ideas and his own st st strategies. But he was also kind of this general from the past, you know, he was like an old world general from like, the time of Napoleon. He thought in broad strokes and spoke in, of anvils and, you know, uh, Pinzer movements and, you know, he made war sound, you know, heroic and majestic. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, he didn't really understand, however, that an, a, an army, a guerrilla army could inflict that kind of damage on a, on a modern mechanized army. And so you kind of had that um, really kind of a certain, certainly also an element of racism underneath all of that, that sure, yeah. you know, the that. Chinese aren't, you know, they're not brave. They're not going to fight against us uh, uh, effectively. And um, so all of those elements are in play, I think, uh, as you lead up finally to the, the actual battle. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, you're watching us on History Happy Hour, and we're talking to Hampton Sides, the author of Desperate Ground, The Marines at the Reservoir, The Korean War's Greatest Battle. And if you have any questions for Hampton, please uh put them up in the comments area and we will try to get to them. And Hampton, you can be assured that you are now coming through much, much better. And so we'll Good. keep that solution in our back pocket for the next time that happens. <laughs> um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the conditions again, because you had started to get on that, but we were having trouble hearing you. But before I do, it seems worthwhile to mention you, you in your book, there are um, MacArthur, and his chief of staff, a general named Ned Almond, who also commands uh, a corps uh, fighting on the peninsula, they do not come off very well. And I think no, Ned, Almond, Ned Almond probably doesn't come off well in any book on the Korean War that I've ever read. Or World War II, for that matter. But. Um, he is a sort of a, 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 a yes man sycophant um, and, and joins MacArthur in ignoring the intelligence. But there is a general who comes off very well in your book, and he is the commander of the Marines at uh, the Chosen Reservoir. And his name is O.P. Smith, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes called the Professor, which I think is an interesting nickname. I, mean, I always thought Marine generals were supposed to be called Mad Dog or Chesty or something like that, but he's the, the Professor. Tell us a little bit about him and why he is one of the heroes of the story. One of Yeah, one of the heroes of the story and also one of the generals who's just absolutely revered by the, the Marine Corps, um, and yet someone that most of us probably never heard of. Um, 
he was called professor because he was he was an academic. I mean, he he had gone to Berkeley of all places. Uh, he was uh, he was a uh, you know he was fluent in French. He he cultivated roses in his spare time. He was uh, just always reading the classics um, and but he traveled all over the world. He was he was a really brilliant person, uh, very well read, very well traveled. Um, he was probably the perfect general for this particular situation, which was, and the situation in a nutshell was, he was being told to race to the Yalu as fast as possible, to any signs of the Chinese and just steamroll ahead. And, and yet they kept capturing Chinese soldiers. They kept interrogating these Chinese soldiers in all sorts of skirmishes and small battles. And the Chinese were like very forth very forthcoming. They'd say, "Well, yeah, we're here. There's lots more of us back there. We're coming, and 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 you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, we're here to stop the uh, Americans from coming into China." Uh, you know, it was amazing what you know the, what they were willing to say. And when this intelligence was sent to Tokyo. Uh, to MacArthur's team, uh, they just didn't want to hear it. They said, well, those are just rogue elements. They're guerrilla forces that are actually North Korean. Uh, they're not really Chinese. They're not really Mao's troops. Um, keep going. And, and, and when you say keep going in that kind of terrain, what it really means is, you know, because there's only one road up into those mountains and it's this twisty, turny, you know, circuitous uh, single lane gravel and dirt road, uh, it means you're going up into these, these mountains and stretching out, you know, really stretching out your, your forces over a hundred miles or more, which is perfect situation for, you know, ambush for, for an army that's coming over the mountains that can cut that convoy of, of men, uh, to pieces. And, and so, you know, you see the litter, you see the letters and, 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 the, you know, the things that, O.P. Smith is writing in his, um, you know, kind of his journal and his notes. It's like he smells a rat. He he says we're going to get destroyed. We're going to have to do a start taking a lot of precautions. And so he's really trying to thread the needle between getting a command to march north and his own instincts, which are to hunker down, to protect his division, to uh, stockpile weapons um, to figure out where where he can have an airfield and get so get airplanes up into those mountains, and he does. He builds this airstrip in the middle of a wilderness. He stockpiles huge resources at a place called Hagaru. He sees really weeks ahead of everyone else that this battle is going to happen. And it's going to happen at Hagaru and right around that reservoir, and. Um, uh, he was right. He was like prescient, you know, and, and because of that, he saved a lot of lives. And um, the Marines um, fought valiantly. They fought with great ingenuity. The first few days, they just fought, held on for dear life because they were getting attacked from all sides. They were completely surrounded by, by Mao's forces. But they um, they pulled all their troops together into this kind of enclave at Hagaru, and then they uh, fought their way out. And you know, one of one of the things people say is like, why is this battle so popular and so famous when it was really kind of it was a retreat? Uh, and of course, what he said was, you know, famously, O.P. Smith said, retreat hell. We, we're just advancing in another direction. Uh, <laughs> or no, sometimes he said we're uh, it's also quoted as saying we're attacking in another direction. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what he really meant by that was when you're completely surrounded by overwhelming numbers of an enemy that wants to kill you, um, movement in any direction is going to be uh, an attack. Um, they had to fight every step of their way back to the sea. And um, so, I mean, they fully expecting they would get to the sea and then they would hold that position maybe through the winter uh, because they, he thought they could stay there. He thought they could dig in and, and hold out for the winter and then maybe uh, contemplate uh, a new campaign in the spring. Uh, but that's not ultimately what happened. Uh, what ultimately happened is they all left in this enormous sea lift operation, uh, the Hamhung evacuation, which is 
you know, it's like Dunkirk. It's this massive um, uh, emergency um, sea lift of evacuation that, where all these men, not just the Marines, but all the Army and UN forces were removed to the south uh, to regroup, which they did. And, and it was very successful. So, Rick, Rick do you, um, I know Jeff has got a question. Do you want to let that one go or shall I yeah, go now? Let's bring it in. Um, so, yeah. So Jeff asks, uh, why isn't the U.S. Army east of Chosen recognized? They reached the Yalu and the USMC did not. And, and just before you answer that, I'll throw up a map, uh, another map, and say, here's the Chosen Reservoir. You can see that the Marines, who are in blue here, they're the blue line, with the Chinese being the, in red, uh, the Marines are to the west of the Chosen Reservoir, but there is an Army group up there uh, to the east or um, um, right, as I say, on this map. Uh, and and we you, you talk about them in the book, but they don't kind of get into legend. They are not really talked about much up there. So why is that? Well, part of it is just that, you know, I had to make some strategic decisions of my own about what to focus on in this enormous battlefield, battlescape. Um, I do talk about the army units you east do. of Chosen, but but they're not the focus of the story, really kind of almost more for, you know, uh, reasons having to do with the architecture of how I want to structure a narrative. Um, also because there are entire books written just about them. Um, there's one called East of Chosen, which is uh, very scholarly and thorough and, and sweeping. Um, the other reason is I, I really wanted to avoid, you know, one of the things that's happened, unfortunately, is that after Chosen, uh, the sort of inter sign conflict between the Army and the Marines yeah. took off. And these two groups uh, were endlessly bickering with each other. And, you know, they try to have these reunions and they just practically gotten fist fights over like who did what or who didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, they, the army units were accused of being, you know, um, uh, cowards uh, that they put down their weapons and ran, which is not what happened. Um, they, what happened really in a nutshell is that the army units east of east of chosen bore some of the worst, you know, brunt of the Chinese attacks. And uh, they also suffered from some, really bad leadership. And then unfortunately, two of their leaders, one after another, were, were killed. And so they, they said it was sort of like an army that didn't have a nervous system. They didn't have leadership uh, because, you know, they weren't getting orders from, from there's a, particularly a commander named uh, Colonel, Colonel Don Faith, who was killed. And after he was killed, uh, you know, uh, really what happened East of Chosen was an, ex was an exact, um, version of what General Smith was worried would happen to the Marines, which is they got spread out very narrowly, thinly on a, a long road on the east side of the reservoir and got cut to pieces and ultimately annihilated by the Chinese. And uh, the only thing they had to do left, I mean, they didn't have any ammunition. They didn't have uh, any help coming from any quarter. They just had to get out on the reservoir ice and uh, make a mad dash for Hagaru in the hope that they would ultimately be rescued, which which many of them were. Uh, but you know, I didn't. I just didn't want to get into that whole thing of like who's the bravest, who's who. You know, all this recrimination of you know uh, the Marines. A lot of Marines are that way. They think that you know we're the best, and uh, you know, uh, I, I I think I have been accused perhaps of drinking too much of the Marine Kool Aid on this story. Uh, but the Marines will tell you I didn't drink enough of it. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, there is something very special about the Marine Corps. It's, it's just the way they, you know, kind of their whole ethos. Uh, there is something amazing about them. But, uh, you know, I'm not um, someone, you know, I'm, I don't come from a Marine family. I, I don't want to sort of uh, sing, you know, single handedly, you know, just put out the Marine uh, propaganda on this story either. Uh, but it is principally the story uh, of, of how the how General Smith and how the Marines dealt with this situation. But it's a, it's a fair question. And uh, the whole story of, of, of what the Army did, I mean, they, they fought valiantly. And uh, unfortunately, they just, 
I think uh, th those units were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they suffered uh, horribly for it. Don't, Hampton, don't ever write a book about the Saipan invasion then, because you'll get into one epically oh. huge pissing match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one question, I mean, I mentioned this when you had kind of gone out and come back in that I'd kind of like to get your thoughts on. You know, you talk about how you're drawn to writing books about you know, people in extreme situations and how they continue to function and then overcome. But with this story, it's not just one person. It's a whole organization. It's 20,000 around people mm -hmm. that not only continue to function individually, but function mm -hmm. as an organized body of men and carry out this epic thing. I mean, I just kind of like to get your thoughts on that because that's, you know, that's your focus, but on a much bigger scale. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work for a magazine called Outside and Outside focuses a lot on like mountaineering and, you know, men against the elements and, and men in extremist, you know, situations. And, uh, and I guess that theme got drilled into my, um, into my psyche and in my imagination a lot when I was an editor at Outside Magazine. And so here we have a situation where I'm applying that those, you know, the, that question of how, how men survive in extreme situations, what sorts of combinations of traits and qualities do you have to summon up to survive um, freezing cold temperatures, uh, harsh geography, um, in some cases, starvation, um, to get through it and to get to the other side, you know, it's really becomes an epic survival story. Uh, as you say, writ large now we're talking about, and, and not just the Americans. I, I look a good bit at the Chinese side Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Chinese suffered even, you know, significantly more than we did. I mean, Mao sent them into battle with these little cotton outfits. They didn't have, they didn't, they didn't have, uh, Many of them didn't have socks. Um, they didn't have gloves, if you can believe it. Um, many of them didn't even have weapons. You know, they were supposed to, like the first wave was supposed to attack, they'd get mowed down, and then the second wave would come along and pick up those weapons of the first wave and, and so forth. Um, Mao was certainly willing to accept casualties on a level that we would find to be, you know, just obscene. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in how they did survive. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, a lot of times, um, religious faith comes into play or, uh, sense of humor, somehow being able to <laughs> find a way to laugh at a situation that is just beyond, beyond belief. So surreal fighting also, by the way, almost all the fighting happened at night in, in the glare of these flares uh, because the Chinese didn't like to fight during the day because that's when they knew the Americans had air superiority. Right. So, so the attacks happened at night. They had been, they had trained, you know, to fight only at night. And uh, so, you know, um, leader, leadership certainly plays a big part of this, you know, down at the field level, you know, platoon level. Um, this is the kind of stuff that Marines really excel at. Um, you know, uh, just thinking like, you know, thinking like a, in small units and, and looking after your platoon at all costs and never leaving a man behind. Um, and, uh, this notion that every man is a rifleman, you know, like it doesn't matter from general Smith on down the clerks and the drivers of trucks, uh, are riflemen. Uh, you know, when, when the shit hits the fan, if I can, uh, say, say, I don't, know, I don't know. This is a family hour, but um, <laughs> and uh, you know, you, everyone has to pick up a rifle and fight, and we're all equal in the, you know, before the exigencies of battle. Um, that ethos permeates the Marines and certainly accounted a lot for their success in this uh, in this battle. There are many stories in your book of personal heroism and bravery. And just looking again over the pages this morning, I found uh, at least three about uh, people who had uh, been awarded the Medal of Honor. And I, there probably are more Medals of Honor from chosen than just those three. There mm -hmm. is also uh, uh, 
an episode in the book where under some very desperate circumstances, a Marine captain orders the execution of a couple of dozen Chinese prisoners, which is carried out. <clears throat> and you write about this in a way that's pretty matter of fact. You, you heard the story from eyewitnesses, uh, you name names. The captain involved, William Barber, was himself awarded the Medal of Honor for the heroic stand of Fox Company, which entire books have been written about Fox Company and, and their stand. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, uh, and in the footnotes, you mentioned that you have never seen the story of the killing of these prisoners in print. So I wondered, did you hesitate to write it? And did you get any pushback on that? Yeah, um, I'm glad you, you, you noticed that um, and noted that. Um, I did a bunch of interviews with this guy named Hector Caffarata, an amazing um, Marine who um, was awarded and you're not really supposed to say awarded. You were saying, I think you're supposed to say that because um, it's not, you know, it's not a contest, uh, but he was, he received the Medal of Honor. Uh, and uh, I was lectured uh, by somebody uh, on that very you never, question. You never say that a person won the Medal of Honor. Yeah. That, that's yeah. what I learned. So I think I hope awarded is okay. Awarded fine, but you're supposed to really say received, but okay. um, so I'm told. He, okay, so I, I was interviewing him and he's unfortunately, Hector has since passed away. But he, uh, we were talking about this, that, and the other, and you know the battle, and and he talked about these prisoners that he had personally um, taken into custody, and uh, kind of looked after for um, a number of hours, and then turned them in to the headquarters uh, at Fox Hill, and then more and more prisoners showed up during the day, and more and more and more, and so suddenly there were like thirty or forty, and um, they were, uh, you know, the barber had a really tough thing, you know, decision to make, which was you got these guys, it's 35 below zero. There's no place to put them. There's no room in the warming tents to keep them warm. There's hardly enough food to, to, to feed them. Um, there's no barbed wire um, to just to create some kind of enclosure. Um, they're completely surrounded by, you know, 10 to one uh, so that if they let them go, they would just go right back to their units and be fighting that night against them. Uh, and uh, so Barber made this decision, which uh, was maybe the most difficult decision he'd ever made. And he, he had been at Iwo Jima uh, and he, he had seen what, you know, the very, very worst kind of ravages. Sorry? Sorry. Keep no, going. Keep going. Um, so he, um, uh, so he made this decision to execute these prisoners. And um, Hector Caffarata told me this matter of factly. And I thought, well, as I, th as I get deeper into the story and deeper into my research, I will find th this in the literature of, of the Chosen Reservoir. Because he was the very first person I interviewed. Well, you know, two years later, I still haven't found any reference to this moment, uh, which is, I think, arguably, um, if maybe definitively, it is a war crime, um, at least according to the strict interpretation of the Geneva Convention. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, the Chinese, there's plenty of examples where the Chinese did the very same, if not significantly worse. Um, but uh, then I was like, what am I going to do here? Um, I know it happened because I did interview others who told me about it as well. Eyewitnesses, people who were there. Uh, but no one wants to talk about it. And they they all said to me, don't talk about the prisoners. Um, it's embarrassing or, you know, it doesn't make us look good. Um, well, you know, if I didn't talk about the prisoners, I would be abdicating my responsibility as a journalist and as a historian. Um, so, I, you know, I decided just to tell it very, as I did in the book, just straightforward you know, matter of factly, um, I've thought about maybe going back and going deeper into it um, because I believe there was a bit of a cover up um, by, you know, the Marines. One of the things they do really, really well is they look after their own. They circle the wagons and um, they managed to circle the wagons um, for decades uh, to protect the reputation of Colonel Barber, who they loved. Uh, who they think got them through this ordeal. Um, 
But, you know, he probably would not have won the Medal of Honor if this had come out. So what do you do? It's, it's a really, really tough situation. Yes, there was some pushback. There were some Marines who called me on this, who wanted to know who, you know, they wanted more names. They wanted more information uh, on where I got this, info, you know, this story. And um, ultimately, um, you know, I, I showed them that it was you know, incontrovertible. I mean, yeah, this, this happened. And they, um, they went away. They, they, I, they accepted my, uh, my version of events, but uh, only very reluctantly. Uh, so yeah, it's, you know, the thing is we, we send men into battle and we send, send them into these just horrific conditions. Uh, and then we, the, we expect them to, 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 you know, observe the laws and rules and, ethics of war. Well, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, and then we're shocked when we find out um, that these horrible things happen in battle. Um, so, you know, the, the fact is they shouldn't have been put in this situation in the first place. They shouldn't, you know, back in the old days, people, you know, when it was cold outside, uh, you know, like there was this sort of gentleman agreement, like, let's meet in the spring, let's shake hands, let's go to Valley Forge. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but you know, weapons wouldn't fire, artillery wouldn't fire, uh, you know, helicopters seized up, engines seized up, uh, grenades wouldn't detonate, uh, and yet they fought on. And, and so much of this fighting was hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, and, you know, they became animals. Uh, and, um, you know, Fox Hill was the very nerve center, was the 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 place where the most heroic and the most difficult fighting took place. Um, I, I know the barber did a lot of soul searching for the rest of his life on this decision. And uh, um, Caffarada and he got into some huge arguments about it. And uh, so, uh, I don't know, it's something I might even return to at some point, because um, I'm, I'm very curious about what that incident did to the, to the men who actually had to carry out the execution and uh, uh, you know, it's a it's it's a, a really really difficult moment in the book and and in that in, in that whole battle. Rick, are you okay? Can you hear me? I can't. Rick's muted. Rick is muted. Rick. Oh, I was oh, okay. You to talk, well, Chris. I had one of the things that. You don't I, think I ever do that, but I do sometimes uh, just mute right. myself well, and wait. Um, and what question I had, you know, I know I, I do a lot of work uh, in the Pacific theater, and I have a difficult time getting Japanese accounts of these battles. And I can only imagine it's got to be even worse trying to dig up the Chinese perspective on the battle. And you do that in the book. And I'd like to know what did you find and how hard was it to get the Chinese voice into this story? And how do you make them more than just the targets for the Marines? Right. Well, one of the things that made it a little easier is that I don't think I've met a single Marine um, who had anything but kind feelings and thoughts uh, and kind of an element of kind of, charity almost for for the Chinese uh, in this battle because they they were suffering so profoundly as well and because they were just used as cannon fodder by their officers and by Mao. Um, unlike in World War II where I interviewed a lot of people who just literally, you know, were consumed with hatred um, for, the Chinese, for the Japanese. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, kind of a uh, residual racism. They could, you know, they could just never get, they could never eat rice. You know, they could never, you know, I've re interviewed a lot of POWs of the Philippine uh, prison camps uh, and their hatred, you know, is totally understandable, but is, uh, you know, was a factor in, 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 in my trying to get, get the Japanese point of view. Um, but still it was very hard for me um, because uh, Chinese, um, especially on the mainland, are still, you know, very wary of journalists and very wary of, there's just sort of an overlay of propaganda still over this battle. Um, and I, I really did not succeed in finding any 
um, Chinese on the mainland who would talk to me. Uh, but I did find a number uh, who had fought with Mao's army, who had ultimately re relocated in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they're a little more, they're freer and they're, uh, you know, they can, they can talk to the media more. They feel like they're not going to be retribution for them. But, so I interviewed, I found three guys who were in the ninth army group, um, who were willing to talk to me through a translator. And, um, you know, at one point I thought maybe I can make some of them major, major characters in the book. Um, but they were reluctant to go that far to, you know, where I could really get that comfortable with them. Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess the truth is I view it as one of the shortcomings of the book is that I don't have, even though I endeavored to have that Chinese point of view told, uh, it's not, it's, there's not enough of it in there. Um, there's still a lot more that needs to be said about the Chinese perspective. Um, there is a book that's coming out uh, this fall um, by a scholar uh, who's from Beijing originally, but he, he teaches at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, it's going to be the very first book on the um, Chinese perspective. And he had shown me the manuscript, and uh, I got to meet him. And um, Zhao Bing Li is his name. And um, I highly recommend that book. It's uh, it, it does open up um, a whole new world. And you know, you see it from that point of view and it's like, wow, it's, it's, uh, yeah. you know, these guys were training, um, to, they, they were getting ready to invade Taiwan. Um, they were, you know, in, in tropical clothes, <laughs> uh, they were getting ready to, to make this amphibious invasion of Taiwan when they got the order. Nope. We're not going <laughs> South. We're going North. We're going up to the border with Man at Manchuria. Uh, and we're going into North Korea. And uh, so they had to shift gears completely and, and they got winter clothing, all that was inadequate. And uh, so, you know, it's just, um, it's just crazy. Um, and they're, 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 what they thought they were going to do and, and how it, everything just turned around. Yeah, yeah. So um, we are, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's typical that the author is the one finding fault with the book. Mm -hmm. um, and saying, well, this is the deficiency and this is the thing that's wrong. And, and uh, I, I think speaking for the many people who've read the book, I, it's far outweighed by, by what's right in it and the varying points of view and the stories. So many amazing stories. We didn't even get into the Air Force, uh, the Navy pilots, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, fantastic rescue mission of uh, Tom Hudner. Uh, um, yeah. and so there's just so much here and I, I, I would highly recommend this book. We, we, we have a few moments left and, uh, I think we'll go a, a few minutes long, but we won't go much long, but, but we did think we would try to twist your arm behind your back and ask you what you're working on now, uh, that might be of interest to people when it comes out. Cause I know you're hard at work on a, on another book. So what can you share? Yeah exclusively with the history happy hour audience. Well, um, yeah, I, I um, so my wife um, said to me, you know, what, why are you always doing these stories that take a, take you to Siberia or Korea? I mean, why are you writing all about the, you know, these cold climate adventure stories? And um, my book in the kingdom of ice took me to, you know, way above the Arctic circle in these, into these islands north of Siberia. And uh, it's like, I'd like to come with you on some of your research trips. <laughs> and I and it's like, you know, you're right. I do have the, I should theoretically can be in control of the stories I choose to tell. So I, I uh, had always been fascinated with the, the stories about Captain Cook, Captain James Cook, um, the British navigator, not Captain Hook, uh, <laughs> not Captain Crunch. Um, but, but Captain Captain Cook and um, you already had to do some explaining here when people ask you about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people like you're writing about a pirate. Uh, yeah, and so I um, I started looking into Captain. You know, I'd, I'd been to Hawaii. We'd been to the Big Island where he was murdered. Uh, I I was trying to figure out. You know, was there a way to tell the story that's not like a big cradle to grave, massive anvil of a biography of, of Captain Cook? Uh, and and, and uh, my wife said, you know, well, why don't you just pick one of his three voyages 
And, you know, that narrows the, the aperture much more and starts to seem like an adventure story, seems a, a little more um, condensed. And, and, and I said, well, well, let me look at the three. And, you know, I started researching it a little bit. And I was like, it's the third, it's the third voyage, the final voyage. Um, and one of the reasons it's the best story to tell is that uh, I'm an American historian and it's the, by far the most American of his voyages. Uh, it happened, it started in 1776, in July of 1776, hmm. uh, while, while the Hessian troops were amassing at Plymouth to come over to put down the rebellion, Cook and his, you know, his two ships, the Resolution and the Discovery, were getting ready to leave on this voyage. The purpose of which was to find um, a Northwest Passage over Alaska um, to go, you know, they knew there was ice up there, but they really didn't know how much. And they thought they could go over Alaska and over Canada and find a, uh, a trade route. Uh, but to do so by going, you know, through the South Seas uh, and go through places like Tahiti and, um, you know, Tonga and uh, Hawaii. Well, they didn't know about Hawaii yet. Hawaii had not been discovered by Europeans. Of course, the Polynesians had discovered it, but uh, that's, the other reason why it's such an American story is that on their way to Alaska, they stumble upon this archipelago, this amazing place that we now, you know, we call Hawaii. Um, and um, then they go up and map the entire Alaskan coast and nearly get caught in the ice in uh, Alaska. Um, and uh, it's winter, winter is approaching and Captain Cook says, well, where are we going to spend the winter? We got to go somewhere. You know, that place that we, that, place Hawaii that was really nice why don't we go back there and spend the winter and they do and uh, of course that's his demise he is uh, ultimately uh, through a kind of an escalating series of miscommunications and misunderstandings uh, there's violence and he's ultimately murdered uh, he is baked uh, and possibly um, that's okay. endlessly debated of whether he was eaten um, or at least ceremonially eaten. Um, so we, we might have some recipes in the back of the book. Um, you know, is this the origin uh, of the phrase cooked? Yeah, exactly. It is the origin. Um, who knows? Maybe he deserved it. And, you know, of course, since I started working on the book, that we've had this reckoning, historical reckoning with historical figures uh, here in this country, but also all over the world, uh, conquistadors and... Um, conquerors of various sorts and sometimes explorers as explorers are being precursors to colonization and uh cook has been very much a target of this rethinking and this sort of reset hitting the reset button uh, statues have been coming down all over australia new zealand um all over polynesia and um the cook islands uh they they're going to change their name uh, to something else. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, so all of this is to me is fascinating and interesting. It makes the book sort of more current, uh, more controversial and, and a little bit more resonant. So, um, but it is, it is kind of an interesting time to be thinking about, uh, and writing about a, um, a, a figure, uh, who is, um, being re reexamined so thoroughly, um, uh, even as I'm writing, um, so, um, but anyway, that's what I'm working on. I'm, I, I'm just having a ball with it. Um, uh, snuck in a trip to Tahiti with my wife and, um, uh, uh, and also a trip to New Zealand, uh, before COVID set in. And now I can't seem to go anywhere. I need to get to England. I need to get to Alaska. I need to get to, uh, um, Hawaii, of course. Um, uh, but, uh, that will, that will come right now. I'm just hunkered here in my office writing as fast as I can with what I have so far. And, uh, it's, it's a fascinating topic for sure. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Well, Hampton sides, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. And, and, and despite our, our relatively brief audio problems, absolutely fascinating interview. And you talked really, um, honestly and, and thoughtfully about so much. And I, I'm sure we all await this book. We're sorry to have taken away a few hours of your writing time uh, to pre prevent you from getting that out faster. Yeah. So uh, uh, we so appreciate your joining us today.
Yeah, likewise. It's been a real pleasure. Fantastic. We've been talking to Hampton Sides, who's the author, uh, of course, of On Desperate Ground. And uh, it's about the Marines, the reservoir, and the greatest battle of the Korean War. Uh, Chris, he's uh, uh, terrific. Uh, very this book, guys. It really, yeah, it really is. It really, and and just uh, some very thoughtful moments there in that interview. And we've got a few minutes long, but we do have a couple of more things to touch on for those yeah. of you who want to stay. Well, I so I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, do you have that that one uh, picture? Whatever you want, Chris. You just uh, have Mr. to. Drys, Douglas Drysdale. Yes. So um, one of the characters that uh, appears in Hampton's book uh, is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Drysdale. There's a picture there. Um, and uh, as many of you know, I have a, a great deal of interest in um, Great Britain's military history uh, and their contribution. And there were uh, British soldiers at the Chosen Reservoir. Uh, Colonel Drysdale um, commanded 41st Independent Commando um, at the reservoir. It was a force of 200 or 250, depending uh, on um, what you read, uh, Royal Marine Commandos uh, that had deployed uh, to Korea as part of the UN United Nations effort. They'd been involved uh, in a few of the commando operations uh, prior to going to the Chosen, and they're attached uh, to the Marines there. Um, and uh, they go uh, up with the Marines to the Chosen. They fight there. They are issued American uniforms and equipment when they first deploy to Korea. Um, when they go to Korea, they're, they're wearing civilian clothes. When they get to Korea, they're given American uniforms, equipment, weapons, etc. cetera. Uh, but being Royal Marine commandos, they refuse to wear helmets and they wear their green berets. Uh, and they had a reputation amongst the Marines at the Chosen for um, wearing, I mean, for, excuse me, for shaving every day even amongst the extreme cold. Wow. And my connection to the story and why this kind of came to me when reading the book is uh, many, many years ago, right after college, I had lived in, uh, came to England to interview veterans. Uh, and I was taking a train to Portsmouth one, one day um, and I was reading a book about the First World War because I was gonna meet a First World War veteran. Uh, and this elderly gentleman got on the train with me and he was dressed as the central casting figure of a British gentleman, you know, tweed jacket and mustache and regimental tie. Um, and uh, he had his Royal Marine veterans pin on his lapel. And for about two hours, he talked to me about what I was doing and my interest in history and World War One and um, all of this. Um, and so all of a sudden, uh, we pull into this one station many uh, hours later, and he says, well, I, you know, best of luck. And he goes to reach out his hand to me. Um, and he has the e he has cufflinks on his shirt with the EGA, the Eagle Globe and Anchor, the American Marine Corps logo on his sleeve. And I must have had some reaction to that. And he said, oh, well, you know, I'm an honorary Yank. And I kind of stuck back. And this all just took moments. And he said, um, uh, I was at the Chosen with your blokes. Uh, that Marine detachment had suffered 50% casualties. Of the 200 men who went up, only 100 came out. He was one of them. He shook my hand and he left the train. And as he left the train, he said, Semper Fi. Wow. And when I read, I, and, and I kind of held that story close. And then when I read Hampton's book, I went, wow. Amazing. Well, wow. I think, I think um, on that note, we have to, and we're only running eight minutes behind. We have to, uh, to wrap up this edition of History Happy Hour, but it's been a really uh, incredible hour talking about uh, the Korean War uh, with uh, Hampton Sides. I know Chris Anderson and I have both appreciated that. And I'll just say very briefly that next week, uh, we are going to be talking to our friend Jerry Propakovich. Uh, I should say Dr. Gerald Propakovich, yes. uh, who is uh, a Civil War historian. And we're going to be talking about Lincoln as an Army commander. And so why don't you think about that? And we'll be posting the reading list tomorrow. And um, think about that. And it'll be an interesting conversation to talk about Lincoln's role in uh, commanding the armies during the American Civil War. And Chris, I'll give you the last word. Uh, stay safe, everyone. God bless.